Sí, decía simplemente que es un placer eh, entonces presentarla hoy a, a Helen King, que es profesora de estudios clásicos en uh, The Open University. Y la razón por la que la invitamos es porque es una gran uh, especialista del pensamiento médico en la antigüedad, incluyendo uh, cuestiones de género y cuestiones de, uh, de sexualidad. Eh, voy a leer un par de títulos uh, de los libros que ha escrito uh, para que dan bien la, la, la idea de, de, su, de, su, de su campo de trabajo. Hippocrates Women, reading, uh, Woman, Reading the Female Body in Ancient Greece, uh, The Disease of Virgins, Green Sickness, Chlorosis and the Problems of Puberty. Um, uh, y después ha participado en otros, en otros uh, libros como Blood, Sweat and Tears, The Changing Concepts of Physiology from Antiquity uh, into Early Modern Europe. Uh, también ha investigado en, en estos trabajos la historia de la histeria y otros trastornos psíquicos en la antigüedad, uh, contribuyendo a colectivos como Hysteria Beyond Freud, History of Clinical Psychiatry, y Contemporary Approaches to the, his, to the Science of uh, Hysteria. O sea que realmente el trabajo de Helen está... Uh, en el centro de las preguntas eh, que nos estuvimos preguntando a lo largo de esta, de esta serie sobre si tienen historia las, uh, las enfermedades mentales y hoy uh, va a hablarnos sobre uh, la posibilidad o la imposibilidad de diagnosticar el pasado en el ámbito de los trastornos uh, ansiosos. Welcome Helen, and uh, it will be a pleasure to, uh, to hear you. Okay, so thank you very much, and as you've heard from Fernando, much of my research so far has concentrated on the body, not on the mind. So back in 2010, I was very excited to be invited to a conference by, organized by William Harris on mental disorders in classical antiquity. This was a great opportunity for me to start to think more about diseases of the mind. Over the course of two days, a total of 14 speakers, a busy two days, very busy two days, 14 speakers presented, 13 on topics from the Greek and Roman worlds, and one, Roberto Luis Fernandez of the New York State Psychiatric Institute, um, was a professional psychiatrist. And they discussed what he called the dueling nosologies, the, the conflict between the different models of the mind that were being used in US psychiatry today, and in particular um, on the imminent production of DSM-5, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, which is really important in America because a disorder has to be in that list if you are to claim money for it in terms of your treatment. So you have to be in Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. So at that point, in, in 20, 2010, the new version was being presented, so mental disorder was a very important topic. I gave a paper there um, on what I called, at that point, fear of falling, fear of flute girls, phobia in epidemics five and seven, where I looked at the two existing cases of phobia from the Hippocratic corpus. Now, the Hippocratic corpus is what I've mostly worked on. Most of it dates from the 4th century BC, and probably these two cases are mid-4th century. And the two people in it are Nicanor and Democles. And on the handout, you have, um, under item two, the two cases I'm going to be concentrating on today. In 2013, the same year that DSM-5 appeared, has everyone got the handout? No handout? Handout, we need handouts. Yep. Handout crisis. Brilliant, you need this handout. So in 2013, the same year that the fifth edition of this diagnostic and statistical manual appeared, the paper came out, and reference one is simply to my original paper on these two cases. Now the paper I wrote in 2013 has proved to be a little bit controversial. There's been some disagreement, which is always exciting as an academic, when people hate what you've written, and one person hates it. So I want to talk briefly about what I did in that paper, why I did it. Then second, I want to say something about the subsequent reception of my argument, 
and to think about what that says about how we diagnose mental conditions as historians. And then finally, I want to come to the historical reception of these two Hippocratic cases and end by offering you a different way of reading the stories. So I think, if nothing else, this should prove to you that in 2010 I thought one thing, in 2013 I thought something else, and now in 2017 I've thought of another way of thinking about this. So it's changing, and, and that's, you know, I think that's good. Um, why not? And I hope what I have to say can be applied beyond phobia for how we do the history of mental illness in other conditions and other historical periods. Now, you've got the cases on your handout, and here they are again. And I start this slide with a quote from Helen Saul's book, and you have on your handout the list of references, but don't worry about that now. Helen Saul wrote a popular book in 20, 21, 2001, Phobias Fighting the Fear. And this is what she said about Hippocrates. It's wrong. Hippocrates saw many people with different phobias, ranging from agoraphobia to social phobia to animal phobia, actually no. There are only two cases of phobia in the Hippocratic corpus, and neither is probably by the historical Hippocrates, who probably didn't write anything in the Hippocratic corpus, but we don't need to worry about that now. So within the Hippocratic corpus, there are seven books of case histories which look at named individuals and their illness. Within those seven books, book five and book seven have a lot of cases in common. One has been copied from another. Um, handout emergency at the back there. Large handout emergency at the back. Fabulous. Hello and welcome. You haven't missed much yet. So within the Hippocratic Corpus, Hippocratic, the Epidemics 5 and Epidemic 7 have several cases in common, and that's what those numbers are showing you. There are actually 54 chapters which appear in both collections. And among those shared ones are these stories of Nicanor and Democles, which you also have on your handout, so when this isn't on the screen, you can see them here instead. Nicanor suffers from fear brought on by hearing the sound of the flute the aulos, and on your handout, the picture at the top is of an aulos being played. It's like a flute, but it has two pieces, and there are lots of discussions about how it was played, whether one side plays a sort of drone sound and the other one plays the melody or what, so lots of issues. We'll come back to the flute in detail in a minute. So Nicanor suffers from fear whenever he goes to a drinking party, a symposium, and hears the aulos, the double flute. Democles, who was with him, and that's really unusual, two men coming to see the doctor together. Never happens. All the other case histories are one patient, then the next one, another patient. But here, these two are somehow linked. Democles suffers from fear of heights and bridges. He can't even go along. Um, a very low ditch. He has to get off and go through the ditch himself. The text gives us no hints as to why these two men turn up together. In these Hippocratic case histories, it's very interesting that in the first one we have, he said, whenever he, he said that he could hardly bear it. We have the voice of the patient. This is very unusual. And in the second version of, Demo of Democles, the one in book seven, that also includes, he said. He said he could not go along a cliff. So in both cases, the patient's voice, not a medical diagnosis. And I think with mental illness, this makes sense, because you can't see what's happening in someone's mind. You can hear what they say, how they express their fear, but you can't see inside their mind. So immediately, by having their voices, the patient's voices, we can see why mental disorders are different from physical ones. Although, in Hippocratic medicine, the same causes may be behind physical and mental. In both cases, it's the balance of fluids in the body 
Too much of one fluid, not enough of another, leads to mental or physical symptoms. Now, the part which here which could be based on observation is in uh, Democles, the bit in red, blind and powerless of body. He seemed blind and powerless of body. That's hard to interpret. Is it what the doctor can tell by looking at him? He seems to have difficulty seeing. Or is it, again, the patient's voice saying he feels like this, he can't see properly, he feels weak? And on the handout item three, you just have the Greek words for that. So powerless of body translates lusisomatane. This is a really odd word, lusisomatane. It's never found anywhere else in ancient Greek. So is it a word the patient has created, has made up for himself to express what he feels like, loose-bodied in some way? It's really hard to know. The verb translated as blind, ambluosane, is actually difficult too. It could mean just seeing unclearly. It doesn't mean completely blind. It could just mean blurred vision, some uncertainty in vision. It's been translated as dim-sighted. And there's another case in the Hippocratic texts where this appears. And in that one, the doctor is, asked, asked, is told to ask the patient, do you have this? Do you have ambluosane? So if you can't see it for yourself as a doctor, it's not obviously apparent. This man doesn't come in blind and unable to see. He has to be asked whether he has difficulty with his vision. Now, in pretty well any sort of historical analysis, the first question to ask must be, what kind of text is this? What are the epidemics? And that's another big question in studying ancient Greek medicine. A lot of writers today who mention these cases will describe them as early clinical descriptions. I don't think that's right. Clinical description is far too technical a term for these. They sometimes are more detailed. They give day-by-day -day accounts. On day one, this happens. On day two, another symptom. On day three, and so on. But mostly, they are more like this. Notes to self. Key points may be observed with a view to going back and finding larger patterns. But that's also misleading. These are from Epidemics Book 5 and 7. Of the seven books, books 1 and 3 have historically been seen as by the real Hippocrates himself, although they probably aren't, but they've been read in terms of Hippocrates making notes and then going back and finding the patterns. I think that's been challenged a lot lately. Um, for example, and this is on the handout, Volker Langhoff in his book Medical Theories in Hippocrates, 1990. Langholf argued that actually these are seen through the filter of prior theory. You start with the theory, you then observe something, and you understand it in terms of the theory. So theory-led, not observation-led. And books five and seven have historically been neglected they came back into focus in the 19th century when the great French translator of the Hippocratic texts, Émile Littré, was impressed by the amount of detail in them. Detail is good. So here, there's quite a lot of detail, so this is good. So they're not necessarily observation from which theory comes. They are observations made through theory. Within the two books, five and seven, these stories come within a longer section on cases of melancholia, melancholy, an excess of one of the fluids of the body, black bile. Melancholy and fear are closely linked in Hippocratic medicine. Um, item four on the handout is just a little quote from aphorisms. Fear, phobos, or depression, dysthymia, that is prolonged means melancholia. So if you have fear for a long time, it is a sign that the cause is black bile. Now, this is one of the ways that historically people make sense of Hippocratic medicine. You find something in one treatise, you find something in another, you put them together, 
one explains the other. Of course, it's not clear whether that really is what you should be doing. They could be written by different people with different theories, and maybe we're wrong to connect them. But historically, aphorism six has been connected to these. That's been reinforced because aphorisms was very important in the history of medicine. In the medieval period, it was used to, uh, as one of the basic texts of medical education. You would study aphorisms one and three, uh, sorry, aphorisms and epidemics one and three as part of your training. They were seen as genuine works of Hippocrates. Now, I've already introduced the epidemic stories about these two men. There is one further reference to Nicanor in the Hippocratic Corpus, and that occurs in a very different section of the Hippocratic Corpus, what's called the Pseudepigrapha. Epigrapha letters and pseud false. So these are letters which appear to be by Hippocrates, but were clearly written some hun maybe 100 years, 200 years after Hippocrates probably died. And they're therefore a different level of the Hippocratic corpus. In letter 19, there is a reference um, to Nicanor. He's not named here. There was another who was seized at the symposium by fear of the flute girl. When he heard it in the daytime, he suffered no effect. This is clearly Nicanor, and this shows that that text was known to the writer of the Pseudepigrapha. The case is given after a discussion of the preceding chapter in Epidemics Book 5, which is a case due to bile. And the writer of the Pseudepigrapha assumes there are these two types of madness, madness from phlegm, which is quiet, now this from bile, which is violent. Which is interesting because there's no sign in this story of any violence. And Nicanor seems quite calm. He's, he's afraid, he's scared, he's got anxiety, but he isn't violent. Nevertheless, that's what this writer thinks the story's about. Now, the writer of this text clearly knew Epidemics 5 and or 7. And slightly later, there's another possible echo of the stories uh, in another medical writer, Caelius Aurelianus, um, on chronic diseases, where he talks about a fear, which is a fear of something which is harmless, but it overpowers the patient. And he talks about how people will be afraid of caves or obsessed by the fear of falling into a ditch. So Democles falling into a ditch has become a sort of typical example of things people are afraid of, which they have no need to fear. It's safe, but they're afraid. So let's come back to Nicanor and the flute girl on whom I want to concentrate. Back to that. And in particular, this context of the symposium. He suffers from fear of the flute girl, not fear of the flute itself. It seems to be the person Playing the, medical in, playing the musical instrument. And it's in a very specific context. It's the drinking party, which is also described here as the symposium. And it's when the flute begins to play, which is quite early in the symposium. So let's think about that context of the flute and the symposium. The flute, the aulos, this double flute which you have at the, the top of the handout, this is used in many contexts in the ancient Greek world. It's not just used at these parties. It's used, for example, at the theater to start a production. It's used in warfare. It's used to keep rhythm. But it's also used at these drinking parties, the symposiums. For Nicanor, it's only at night, it's only at the drinking party that he has this problem. So I've argued that rather than the flute, the context in which the flute is heard, the symposium, is important. And at those symposiums, although it's a drinking party, I don't think it's the alcohol which is the problem. Now, some interpreters of these stories have said that the problem is Nicanor is alcoholic. He has a problem with alcohol. I don't really think so. He's just gone to a party, you know. He doesn't have to be alcoholic. And it's the beginning of the party, when the flute starts to play, when he has the problem, not later, when he's been drinking. And it's not just any party. It's the symposium. 
If you look at very early 18th century translations of this text, they'll call it a drinking bout, or they'll call it a feast. In 1925, John Oliver, who I'll come to later, described it as just when of an evening he took his first drink. It sounds quite relaxed, just went down to the bar, had a drink. It's not that relaxed. It's a very specific drinking context. It's the symposium. And the symposium is a very special place in ancient Greek culture. It's a place of competitive masculinity. It's a place where men go, men of all classes. We read about elite symposiums, but people in lower classes also had these drinking parties where you sit, where you share a couch, where you drink, where people will suddenly ask you to compose a poem. If I say to you now, you know, make up a poem about Donald Trump, you know, now, it, this is quite difficult. It's that sort of context. You're, you've been drinking, someone will make a challenge, you have to come up with something. It's very competitive. There's a lot of social pressure. There's also sexual pre pressure. The services offered by the flute girl don't just include music. Now this again is, is quite controversial. Older scholars argued that the flute girl was a very um, accomplished performer, that it was a difficult instrument to play, that she was a great musician. Other scholars argue it's actually not about the music at all, it's about the sex that she also offers. So, you know, how do we know? We probably don't. So I suggested in my 2013 article that the flute girl and the sound of this flute remind Nicanor of what I called a past failure, sexual or otherwise, during the symposium. So at some point he'd had a bad experience at the symposium where he'd failed to compete with the other men. I also argued in 2013 that the two stories have something in common in that for both of them, there's something about being on the edge. For Nicanor, it's just when the music starts. It's when the party is beginning properly that he, he feels terror. For Democles, it's literally on the edge. He can't go along a cliff. Both of them have a sort of on the edge moment. And therefore, in 2013, I came down in favor not of social phobia for Nicanor. It's not He's terrified of being with other people. Instead, I think it's to do with this very specific social context of the symposium, where he's competing with other men and he has a memory of a failure. Now, some people who reviewed my, the book in which my paper appeared believed what I told them. Um, others didn't. So Molly Jones Lewis, in the Bulletin for the History of Medicine for 2014, argued I guess she understood cultural context, so the, the symposium, and desperately trying to avoid retroactive modern diagnosis, but still somehow contributing to what, what, what we think of in terms of how mental diseases develop and manifest. I like that. Uh, I was indeed trying to resist retrodiagnosis. There were lots of diagnoses of Nicanor around, which said he was afraid of music, so hence the flute. He had an obsession that he was alcoholic, and I really didn't see any of those. I think it's very specific. He was afraid of being shamed, being embarrassed in a cultural context. Jennifer Kosak, who reviewed it in a classics journal, Classical Review, similarly got the point. And this is a summary of what she thought I did. So the context, the symposium context, but also how looking at the history of how these have been diagnosed makes us think more about cultural context. So this was good. I'm encouraged. Uh, I think it's important to see that in the 1960s, classical scholars were realizing that the symposium was a very important part of ancient culture. And it was part of the point where social anthropology started to influence classics, and the feasting context was compared to other examples from around the world of a sort of big feast where everybody spends a lot of money on food, um, and then there's a sort of competitive um, way of using that economic surplus. 
So I wanted to emphasize a very specific cultural context. But as classics, as classical studies was moving towards this symposium interest in the 1960s, at the same time, psychiatry was discovering a very specific phobia, social phobia. Social phobia in which the sufferer avoids any social context because of fear of being embarrassed, which is, I think, the most researched of all the phobias now. But in terms of the diagnostic standard manual, which I talked about earlier, it really wasn't a phobia at all. It was a phobia should be about a relatively specific stimulus, like dogs or bridges or flutes. Social phobia is much bigger. So it's a different sort of phobia. In the 1980s, the term social anxiety disorder was developed. And on your handout, the point five has got the, the details of what social anxiety disorder now is after 2013. So if you think about the two cases we've looked at um, and think about what precisely um, They've, they've got, and actually it might be quite useful if I just flick back there. So that's, actually I'll go to nine. I hope this is gonna work. Mm. Okay, so go back to those two. Um, if you think of those in terms of DSM-5 and social anxiety disorder, a persistent fear of one or more social or performance situations, well, one, it's the symposium, the individual fears they'll, they'll act in a way that's embarrassing or humiliating. Mm, possible. The person realizes this fear is unreasonable or excessive. Well, the fact that both of these people have gone to a doctor indicates they think there's something wrong. You know, this is excessive. If you just thought it's okay, you wouldn't go to the doctor. Um, it, yes, it's sort of, in E, it sort of interferes with the normal routine because if one of your things you do in your life is you go to these symposium parties and you can't go, then it does interfere. Yet, he doesn't say he stopped going. It's whenever he heard. Does he still go to these parties? Or does he just not go? We don't know. The fear F, the fear, anxiety, or avoidance is persistent, typically lasting six or more months. Well, this affected him for a long period of time, for some time. There is some sense of a continuation. There's not a bad fit, actually. So I think you could match this to Nicanor, although his problem seems a bit less extensive. It's not every social event, it's just the symposium which upsets him. But social phobia has very much become the big diagnosis, social phobia or social anxiety disorder. And this has become, since the 1990s, the most common retrospective diagnosis of Nicanor's condition. Now, there actually has been a change in the diagnostic manuals here. So in the fourth edition of DSM, um, you had to have excessive or unreasonable fear for a very long time. In DSM-5, the most important thing is the anxiety is out of proportion to the danger and must last for at least six months. So, bearing in mind the willingness of psychiatrists now to label Nicanor as social phobia or social anxiety disorder, one response to my 2013 chapter really surprised me. It was an interesting one. It came from Michael Fontaine, whoops, sorry, um, who wrote in, um, this is on your list of references, I've given you the website, um, madinamerica.com, wonderful title. Mad in America is a site that deals with, with science, psychiatry, and social justice. And Michael Fontaine originally wrote his review in an online um, journal for classics, and then asked to have it reposted on Mad in America. It's a very interesting piece, it's worth reading. It sets our current view of mental illness within the context of the Enlightenment. So the move from the mind to the brain, to something physical, from the self to its molecular substructure. And Fontaine criticizes other parts of the book in which my paper appears, 
He criticizes Harris, William Harris, for using the word symptom rather than the word sign, because he says, by definition, mental illnesses have no signs. If they've got signs, they become a neurological disorder. So they move from the psychiatrist to the neurologist. So there are interesting possible connections one could make here about the use of specialisms and the way that one specialism takes over from another. Neurology clearly has taken over some areas from psychiatry now. But he singles out my essay as one of the few which he says actually disturbed me. I've disturbed him, which is worrying. And this is what he says I do. I retroactively diagnose a man named Nicanor with performance anxiety and I deem him sexually incompetent. Not sure I did that. <laughs> I, I've, I suspected that the man had had a bad experience with a flute girl before, and that's why he became upset when he heard the flute starting. But there we go. And he says, what I'm doing is showing how a diagnostic label can become a weapon for stigmatizing individuals, which is very interesting. I hadn't thought about that before, so I've now thought about it. And the final section of this talk will show how I'm thinking about it. So a weapon. Mm. Now, I didn't actually say that Nicanor was sexually incompetent, and I argued that there was actually a very specific cultural context in which the flute girl actually had an effect on him. And it's not as if um, the music is ever the problem. The music is clearly not the problem. It's the flute girl. So this is the alatris, the flute player. It's not the aulos, the flute. It's the flute girl, the alatris, which is the problem. And the alatris in ancient Greek thought clearly has a bad image. She's sometimes seen as like a prostitute. She plays the pipes, she's also a prostitute. She's often a slave, not a freeborn woman. And plenty of classical scholars would argue that if you say the word alatris, people hear it in the ancient world as expensive prostitute. That's it, really. And I do want to avoid retrospective diagnosis, but sometimes I feel you have to do it. So, <laughs> let's continue into that. I now want to think a little bit about how Nicanor and Democles, these two case histories, have been read. And this is quite a different section, but bear with me, it'll be all right. So, doing the history. Now, most um, late 20th or early 21st century discussions of phobia mentioning Nicanor or Democles come from one article, which you have on your references list. It's the one at the top, Herrera, Some Historical Aspects of the Concept Phobia, 1962. But before that, there's an awful lot of discussion. Herrera in 1962 argued Nicanor and Democles were two of the earliest clinical descriptions of men who feared that which need not be feared. And he argued that melancholy would have been the original um, diagnosis. Some later writers have used this, Herrera 1962, and have sort of merged Nicanor and, Dem and Democles into one person, which is really losing the plot. So someone who's afraid of flute girls and heights and bridges. Uh, no, so Herrera has had a bad effect, I think. But before Herrera, the earliest discussion of phobia is commonly thought to be Westphal's The Agoraphobie of 1872. In the late 19th century, there seems to have been an increase in interest in excessive states of fear, fear that was out of all proportion to any cause. And it would be very interesting if anyone does 19th century medical history and could help me understand why it's around this period that fear becomes such an important medical category. The interest is not just in Germany, it's much wider, and it culminates in G. Stanley Hall's synthetic genetic study of fear in American Journal of Psychology for 1914. This 1914 article by Hall includes 138 different types of fear, all with a Greek or Latin origin in their word, so you, they always sound a bit classical. So there's pteranophobia, which is fear of feathers, and eosophobia, which is fear of the dawn, from Eos, the goddess of dawn. So they've all, they've all got Greek sort of names to them, 138. And it includes aulophobia, fear of flutes, but not 
our latrophobia, fear of flute girls. That's even, for Hall, that's too specific. Even with 138, you can't include flute girls. Now, Irira's 1962 article credits three sources for his comments on Nicanor and Democles, um, one of which is Semelaine's very famous Etude historique sur l'alliance nation mentale dans l'antiquité. Now, that is only one of the three. He also, Herrera also cites Émile Littré, 1846, translation of the Hippocratic Corpus. And it's interesting to me that Littré is actually before um, Semelain. So there's something here I find interesting about the availability in different European languages of Hippocratic medicine and how that actually feeds into changes in medicine. So the existence of a French translation in 1846 then means it can be picked up by the emerging sciences of the mind, so by someone like Semelain. Now before Semelain, going back even further, and before Littré's translation of these texts in 1846, the theory that would eventually be applied to them was being developed by Esquirol um, at the Salpetriere in Paris. Esquirol set up a private asylum in Paris at the start of the 19th century and later influenced French national policy on the treatment of madness. He wrote his treatise on mental illness in 1838 after touring various French institutions for the insane and that treatise was translated to English in 1845. He didn't use the label of melancholy or melancholia. He saw that as too ancient. It had too much of the idea of the four humours, the fluids of the body. He didn't like it at all. It was old-fashioned. So he developed this term lupomania, and the lupe bit comes from the ancient Greek word for depression or for grief, for sorrow. And Ischirol praised Hippocrates in understanding the true causes of lupomania. The trouble with that is Ischirol has his own very different idea of how the body works. So he believed that lupimania, or what we would call phobia, was due to displacement in the colon, in the digestive organs. So he interpreted ancient purging, remedies to, to get things out of the body, as restoring the tone of the, of, the, of the abdomen, of the belly. So he's regarding a very specific physical cause. It's all to do with your bowels, with your digestion. That's what makes you get that's what makes you get phobia for him. So very different theory. But between mania and lupomania, he positioned monomania, which he's probably most famous for, and regarded that as very much due to changes in culture. So hence the quote about the, the dominant ideas, les idées dominantes dans chaque, chaque siècle, which are actually influencing not just the frequency, but also the nature of madness. This is a very important um, statement in the history of mental illness suggesting that you need to understand the context. Hence, with Nicanor, you need to understand the symposium. You need to understand the drinking party to understand why he has these symptoms. It's a cultural context. But Ischirol did not discuss Nicanor or Democles. They weren't yet in psychiatry. It's only in 1869 with Semelain that they really come in. And Semelain argued precisely that following Esquirol, that the history of madness was interesting because it links to the dominant civilization of the time and that the, the frequency and the nature of madness depends on that. So Semelain discussed both Nicanor and Democles in his chapter on melancholy. And that's really how the French tradition gets it. So Littré's translation makes these case histories available. Semelain picks them up, influenced by Esquirol, saying that, that changes in mental illness depend on the culture of the time. Now, in the Anglo-Saxon tradition, it was slightly different. So in Anglo-Saxon, again, there's an important moment in terms of translation. The Loeb translations, the most commonly available English translations, are 1923. But notice, that's Epidemics 1 and 3, not Epidemics 5 and 7, where these case histories come from. They don't appear in Loeb until 1990s, really late. 
So what's happened here is that some John Oliver, whose very influential lecture subsequently published, The Psychiatry of Hippocrates, is 1925, he gives both uh, Nicanor and Democles. Now, Oliver is really interesting as a character. He argued that Latin and Greek should be studied by doctors still. Science was not necessarily the answer because he believed psychiatry was an art, not just a science. If you studied it as an art, you would understand people and how people work. As a science, it wasn't enough. So he argued that, I quote, um, psychiatry is not something to be learned and practiced by any high-grade moron who will devote himself to its study for a certain length of time. So he's pretty rude. He also argued that all psychiatrists should read the Hippocratic Corpus because they'd find it felt very modern. It had a modern atmosphere. So I think his interest in Hippocrates is the result of the 1923 translation of the case histories in one and, Epidemics 1 and 3. But he then used texts that were not easily available in English. He argued that in terms of the psychiatry of Hippocrates, the cities of Greece in the fourth century BC were highly organized. Because they were so structured, there were points of emotional stress and strain. And as a result, phobias developed. So he is linking a very organized society with clear ways you should perform to phobias coming out. And he placed Nicanor and Democles as cases of what he called psychasthenia. So it's weakness of the psyche, weakest weakness of the mind or of the soul. And there's his translation of the story of Nicanor. So whenever he was at a banquet, hosts of fears encompass him. So he's got banquet. He doesn't have the symposium. He hasn't really got the point that the symposium is a very competitive and specific environment, but he's got it down as a banquet. He also doesn't have the comments on how long this lasted, and I'm just going to leap to another slide here, I think. <clears throat> this is challenging. Uh, it work. Okay. Excuse me while I just do something intelligent or try to. Oh, okay, that's not going to work. doesn't matter. So the translation um, is quite interesting. When dot, 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 whenever he was at a banquet, when, whenever, could suggest that Nicanor was terrified by a woman playing the flute on one occasion, and then afterwards he had the same reaction, whenever, so any, any further versions. This deviates a bit from Littre. I don't think he's directly using the French translation here. He's doing something slightly different. There's one further um, contribution from the French tradition which is Suc, Alexandre Suc, who in 1934 published two articles in the Revue Neurologique. He described both Nicanor and Democles, and his point was that although the Hippocratic knowledge of anatomy and physiology of the brain was quite small, nevertheless Hippocrates was good at observing. He could see. He talks about the admirable observations uh, the irreproachable observations. And he used Littre's translations. He clearly was basing, based on that. And again, that then actually links into the Anglo-Saxon tradition. So Freeman, that's Walter Jackson Freeman, who was the guy who developed the frontal lobotomy in 1936, um, he summarized Suk's articles and believed very much that psychiatric conditions had organic origins, so actually operating on the brain was what you needed to do. So a very different um, interest in Nicanor and Democles. And both of those, um, Suk and, and Freeman, I think are interesting because there's a point there where the French and the English traditions do connect, but you know, obviously there's nothing in the original cases to suggest you operate on the brain. Now, final section. One possibility I didn't consider in 2013, new bit. The possibility is this. Is it 
may be the case, that both Nicanor and Democles are entirely fictional constructs, made up entirely, with no reality at all behind them. I hadn't really thought about this until I read a review of the, he the Helen Saul book, Phobia, Fighting the Fear, which I mentioned earlier. And this is a review in The Spectator for 2001. The review summarizes Helen Saul and mentions Nicanor, but says, brackets, a conspirator against Alexander the Great. I'm just gonna give it all away here, okay, so that's what I did, okay. Nicanor, conspirator against Alexander the Great. Now, that is a very interesting thought. There was a real Nicanor. There's also a real Democles, if you, pr if you spell it as Damocles instead of Democles. So working through this cautiously, Nicanor, there were at least 12 people called Nicanor around the time when we know the case study was written. Doesn't mean that, that there wasn't a 13th one, <laughs> who's the case history, we don't know that, but there were at least 12 well-known Nicanors. Many of them were indeed involved um, around the time of Alexander the Great, and there is one who conspired to kill Alexander the Great. Now, the date works. The historical Nicanors were all active around about 330 BC, in which case, did someone create a story about Nicanor that would ridicule him, that would make him look idiotic, a man afraid of flute girls? Come on, nobody can be afraid of a flute girl. What a ridiculous man. Is that what's happening here? Nicanor, ridiculous man, unsuccessful conspirator, scared of flute girls. If that's going to work, what do you do with Damocles, who was with him? Well, it's Damocles in the original, but hey, vowels shift. And there is a very well-known story about Damocles, the story of the sword of Damocles. And early translations of Epidemics 5 do use the word Damocles. The, they've obviously thought it's the same name because they know the Damocles story. The Damocles story is set around 367, 357 BC, so 20 years before Nicanor, so mm, with doesn't really work. But again, it's a story that was probably known to whoever wrote down this Hippocratic case history. The story goes like this. The king of Syracuse, Dionysius II, is in charge. Damocles is a very stupid man. He says to the king, I want to be king. And the king says, great, you be king, sit here. Damocles sits down, but the king has suspended a sword above his head. So all the time Damocles is thinking he's the king, he's looking up and seeing this sword which could fall on him at any moment. And he realizes it's not good being the king. So Damocles, again, a very stupid person. Damocles realizes he doesn't want to be king at all. So what is happening here? Are these two stories entirely fictional? In which case, where do they come from? Anyone who studies the history of case histories in later history, medieval, renaissance, early modern case histories, will know that often when someone compiles a book, they give cases they've seen themselves, they give cases from their friends, and they give cases they've read in books, which they repeat. I don't think anyone's yet suggested that for the ancient Greek case histories, but I think I'm suggesting it now. I'm not sure what I think of it, but it's a suggestion. So the connection with Damocles in the Sword of Damocles story could be, and again, this is where you need to get your hand out again, so Damocles seemed blind and powerless of body and couldn't go along a cliff. There's nothing here about swords or kings, but there is a sort of on-the-edge-ness to it. On the edge, that moment with the sword hanging above you, you know, anything could happen. 
the walking along the, along the cliff thing? Is it a story that was written to, to ridicule Damocles, which has somehow got lost, detached from the story of the sword, and somehow ended up here instead? I don't know, but I'm starting to wonder. Are the stories of both men, then, not about how men should behave, but about how stupid men behave, or unsuccessful men behave? Indeed, are they both ridicule? So, going back to Fontaine's unease about me offering a diagnosis for Nicanor, a diagnosis which Fontaine reckoned I was using to stigmatize him, maybe the two stories are originally intended to stigmatize individuals. So it's not me who's stigmatizing, it's actually the ancient stories themselves are stigmatizing. Now, I really don't know, I've only just thought about this, and I'm I'm going to worry about it a lot more. Are there any other stories in the epidemics which appear to be about real historical individuals and are just made up? I don't know of any, but there's quite a lot to look through and think about. And one thing that occurs to me is that Nicanor and Democles, who turn up together, maybe originally they turned up together in a different sense. They were in a, the same book. They were in the same collection of stories about historical individuals, and the with has somehow got corrupted in the manuscript tradition to imply they're real people who turn up physically to the doctor together. I really don't know. There are other stories about um, ancient figures which, who do seem to be ridiculed because of their medical behavior. Um, the classic one there, I suppose, would be Pericles, the great Athenian general who is described as being ill from the plague and various women come along and hang magical amulets on him and he's too weak to sort of throw those off. That's again a story which could be about someone trying to damage his reputation. And there's one other possibility which is a connection to the medical inscriptions of the ancient world. Now alongside the texts we have, uh, from the Hippocratic Corpus for example, we also have inscriptions from healing sanctuaries temples to the god Asclepius, where people put up a story about what had happened to them, the disease they'd had, the treatment, usually the god appears to them in a dream. And those case history collections, we actually have some real stone inscriptions, but at the same time, we also have um, a lot of lost inscriptions. Now, did someone write down stories from a shrine and there's a couple of other historical individuals here. I won't go into these in detail because I have no more time. Libanius is a very famous pagan intellectual from the late antique period, fourth century AD, who we know suffered from some sort of phobia. He described this, this is on the handout, final piece number six. Libanius, Libanius describes here um, how the sun was hidden there was a crash, a thunderbolt, he was blinded, he thought he was okay, but then when he got back home, he broke out into a sweat of fear and leapt into bed. And Libanius went on throughout his life having these attacks of fear, phobos, as in phobia, um, which he attributed to this lightning strike earlier in his, in his life. Now, he did go to a temple of Asclepius. He suffered from, these, from migraines, from bad head pains um, as a result of this, and he went to a, a sanctuary of the god Asclepius, and he was a lot better. So he did go to a temple with what we might call phobia or fear reaction or something like that. He did go there. So it's po perfectly possible that people went with phobia-type symptoms to the gods rather than to medicine. Slightly earlier, second century AD, Elias Aristides um, was, like Libanius, um, an orator. And like Libanius, he wrote about his own experiences and had various disturbing um, uh, episodes of illness. He went to both the doctors and the temple. So people combined doctors and temple all the way through the ancient world. So I don't know where to leave that. It's quite a nice position to be in. I'm now starting to wonder whether these case histories 
really do relate to any individual at all, um, and if so, whether it's a historical individual who is being ridiculed, or whether there was an actual patient who went to the, the doctors. If Nicanor and Democles are real patients, as opposed to stories made up to attack historical individuals, perhaps their story came from a sanctuary of the god, and the person who transmits the cases to us originally saw them there. But if they are both stories created to insult, to attack real people, I think it's quite ironic that in the history of phobia, these are the two cases who are always still being quoted as the earliest cases of phobia with the assumption that they are real. Maybe they're not. I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Uh, abro el suelo para preguntas, comentarios. Si alguien no se anima a preguntar en inglés, eh, yo voy a traducir eh, y voy a hacerlo viceversa si hay alguna dificultad. Eh, bueno, mm. I'm, I'm going to start. I'm going to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to launch the, uh, hear the question. I actually thought while you were talking about your last option. Mm. that these were not real characters. But in a different, uh -huh. but in a different perspective that yeah. I'm going, to, uh, that I'm going to, uh, to bring up, I thought about that possibility in connection with something that fascinated me in your talk, which is um, how the transformations of the current uh, nosographical mm. systems, DSM-3, 4, and 5, they seem at every step to open new possibilities for interpreting the past. Yep. Um, yep. This is, this is uh, somehow not exactly in the, in the sense of a very straightforward retrospective diagnosis, but of asking questions about the past. So for example, yeah. uh, so for example DSM-5 uh, opens up the possibility not of simply uh, coming up with a new retrospective diagnosis for Nicanor, but uh, to a heightened awareness of the role of context. Right. So in fact, yep. a, a, modern, a modern diagnosis helps you reread, the, it says you see in the ancient case things that early commentators had not seen or had not emphasized because they didn't have that, uh, they didn't have that gaze. So uh, this just made me think that the whole problem of retrospective diagnosis about which until today I had a very clear opinion, uh, <laughs> namely it's uh, junk. Um, uh, your talk has, has helped me really considerably to uh, have a more nuanced uh, understanding of the limits and possibilities of that, and maybe that should not be called retrospective, mm. retrospective diagnosis. But in the context of thinking this while you were, um, while you were talking about DSM-5 and about the importance of, uh, the importance of context, um, came up the following question, well, what about, what about literary cases? Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, I, I remembered Freud's aesthetics, Freud's and then many other commentators diagnosing literary characters in Shakespeare, in Greek tragedy, in Roman tragedy and so on, uh, as if they were real characters, you yeah. know. And because these are pieces of writing, I thought, well, what is the difference in the end? What is the difference between Nicanor and Democles and, uh, and trying to identify what they, what they were suffering from, from um, diagnosing, uh, diagnosing Hamlet or diagnosing, you know, Oedipus. Ajax or Ajax. Oedipus. Yes. Uh, Oedipus. Yes. So, um, so, so, so the question here was, uh, isn't the case always, even today, that writing a clinical case ipso facto transforms the patients who are being described into something like literary characters? Yes. This is, of course, yes. not, not always... Not, not always, this doesn't always happen in the same way, you know, so uh, a clinical case described, you know, very shortly in a, in a scientific article in a clinical journal does not have the same status 
as a case described in one of you know, the, uh, Oliver Sacks' bestsellers. Mm. But nevertheless, the fact of putting the case on paper uh, mm. already does something, to, does something to the real patient. And in a way, in a way, um, um, puts aside the question of the reality of the reality of the case. Of course, Freud's cases are the most egregious examples yes. of this uh, this uh, uh, problematic borderline between the literary construction of a case and the clinical construction of a case. Because, as Patrick Mahoney has studied in detail, you know the. Freudian cases are literary constructions that differ very, very importantly from Freud's actual clinical notes. Yes, that's the thing. We have, um, the, we have the notes, we have the stories, yeah, so we can exactly. see the difference so, there. Um, yes. but, but, yeah. but beyond beyond the whole debate about whether Freud forged his cases, you know, about the nature and consequences of these literary transformations, uh, isn't it nevertheless the case that just writing the case uh, obliterates the, the, the borderline between the real character and, and, the, and the unreal character. So you see, yes, I, yes, thought, I thought about this problem, or I, I, was, mm. I came to think about this problem in a different perspective, you know. Mm. I, I, I didn't know about the 12 Nicanors uh, of Alexander the Great's uh, time. But uh, so anyway, so um, I guess it's a comment, and I guess there was a mm. question in, in, in the commentary, and maybe you can, you can Yeah, uh, you I think can that's, it. that's really helpful, and I think when I've been using the case, the words case history, I tend not to use case mm. history all the time. I tend to want to call it case story. So this is my, my language for this. If you call it a case story, you're then emphasizing the way that the narrative has had an effect on what you've got there. And I find this so interesting because narrative medicine is such a big thing at the moment. Mm. The idea that, that actually telling a story, creating a story for yourself when you're ill helps you understand how the different bits connect, well, makes a way in which they make sense, and that the role of the doctor can be to help you make a good story. So the whole sort of Howard Brody thing, you know, my story is broken, can you help me fix it? That illness is in a sense a story that's gone wrong, and you need to make that narrative up again to make the story work so that you are then in a good position, not a bad position. But this... That's why I call this slide undercutting the story, because it is, it is a story thing, definitely. And as soon as, you, as soon as you make a narrative, you're getting a sort of cause and effect pattern. You're connecting things. You're selecting significant things. It has to be narrative. But what you said at the beginning there about how do you do this with historical, um, with literary characters, so Hamlet, Ajax, Oedipus, very interesting. Um, I now need to go away and read some more Greek tragedy, and indeed, and read the read the attempts to diagnose Greek tragedy and its characters. Um, is it different from mental and physical conditions? Is something I'd wonder about. Well, I think for, for physical conditions, of course, the I think I'm, I'm thinking about people like Mirko Gourmet mm. and, and and other uh, histories of medicine. You know, they use a lot of material vestiges like sculptures and, yes. and, and paintings, but especially you know, for deformed bodily deformities, yes. for example, a lot of sculptures, things represented in you know, uh, tombs and so on. So there is a difference because, because the mental illness is only known by, by in a way, what is, what is said. Okay, mm, really let's open the Thank floor. You. Maybe, maybe the, our little change has, uh, has uh, yeah, that's uh, very inspired interesting. Uh, Yes. Creates a literary character and then you reject the whole pattern. Oh, you've got a microphone. I'm not going to read it. Yeah. Well, no, it really? <laughs> well, uh, I, I was thinking that there is always a feedback between creating a character and then understanding uh, a real person and mm. his suffering. Mm. I mean, projecting the whole thing, the pattern there. Yes. You know? But my point is also, how if you make um, um, fear a point of the region, I mean, if you love uh, um, uh, for Nicanor because of his stupid fear, mm. uh, there is something like um, differential differential 
understanding about fear. Yes. I mean, so maybe yes. these things are used to distinguish between a technical idea of fear and a more popular idea of fear. I don't know. Yes. Yes, and of course, fear is fear is something which you really can't have um, in a in a culture where there's not a professional army, where everybody is potentially a soldier in battle, fearless. Fear is just not an acceptable thing to have. It's very different, I think, in other cultures. So there's something quite interesting going on there too. Um, yeah. Okay, I'm just, I'm still thinking about that. Sé que acá hay bastantes estudiantes de psicología, a lo mejor tienen alguna pregunta específica. Sí. I was reading recently uh, this book of Bettenheim and yes. uh, the, the book that speaks, that, that talks about fairy tales and I was thinking your, yeah. your comparison about the, if it's just something uh, that they made up or it, is this real? And I was thinking about fairy tales and mm. what would be your opinion like in some way they're helpful. Yes. So, yes. What, what would be wrong if, if it's just fiction that, that actually helps for say something in, right. in one way? And at first you were, you were saying that mm. uh, you will focus in the physical part. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I got a little bit lost in, in that way. Mm -hmm. Why would you refer that this, this is about the physical part and, and not the mental part? Yeah, okay, so there's, there's two things there, both very yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's just a question, yeah, just separate questions. So the physical and mental part, I mean, that's, again, that's very interesting because in, in the original context in these stories, where the cause of the symptoms is melancholy, is black bile, that is a physical cause that's affecting the mind. But then as history goes on and the humoral model of the body disappears, that sort of holistic approach has gone, and you don't, you don't have it any longer at all. So you'd have a, an idea of mind and body as, as more separate. So it's just a change there. So it's like the same story is being used within a humoral context where body and mind are similar, but then the story continues even though the theory has changed. And I think that needs more, think, more thought, definitely. The fairy tale thing is very interesting, because yes, you're right, fairy tales are helpful. So could you see these stories as in some way being helpful? What are they trying to tell you? Are they just telling you that people who are f afraid of flute girls are you know, pathetic, not proper men, not interesting? Or are they actually giving you some advice as a man on how you should behave? Uh, that you could, should never be afraid of women at any time, for example. Mm. That, you know, what can this girl do to hurt you? Nothing. I don't, I, again, I need to think, but as I say, I need to think anyway, because only writing this paper did I start to think, actually, perhaps the whole thing's imaginary. So this is all very helpful. I no, shall go away and worry about Bettelheim as well. And about that, I would like to say one more thing, because that makes yeah. me think that maybe the DSM should be made in like one different for each culture for say something. Yeah. Like to be more helpful and not just to medicate people. Yes, which is a very good point. And because it is used to medicate people and it's used to stigmatize people, definitely. And I think that's a sort of underlying question of this talk, particularly in the context of your series, that how far is this, is this actually about medicine being used to stigmatize people, um, how far can you apply categories, not just across time, but also, as you suggest, across cultures at the same time? Is any of this valid? Uh, and what happens once you start to have a classification system that, that you know, broadens out uh, to include, include things that you know in 20 years' time won't be there? You, you think back to the history of, of mental illness and, for example, the idea that masturbation is a disease, you know, and we don't think that, but we did used to think that. Um, how does that shift? At what point does DSM no longer have power? 
because it, it's it's a very serious collection of things. You know, if <laughs> really these things are diseases, yeah. even now you, there's a lot of debate. So yes, in the future, who knows? Um, I wonder what Nicanor is going to be diagnosed as having in the future. <laughs> uh, it's interesting because I think you, you mentioned Bettelheim, but there's also you think of something you know like Levi Strauss and the idea of things being good to think. Is Nicanor as a story good to think that you can do th you can actually use this in many different ways, and that's why the story goes on throughout. Um, history of medicine from 19th century onwards as you know, a really, really important story. I also want to, and this is, this is off topic, but I also want to look more at the very early translations of the story. So I found lots of 18th century translations and I've only really noticed before the point that they don't include the symposium. They don't get that social context because they wouldn't because it really isn't understood properly, I don't think, until the 1960s. But what else do they do with the story? And how far are those, are the stories, how far do the stories escape from the translation of the text? Are they just there in Epidemics 5, English translation of 1780 or whatever? Do they move out? How do they start to get used there? So I think I've got another lifetime's work ahead of me here. <laughs> but thank you, that's very helpful. Which is the, uh, the connection between the kind of uh, work that you, you've discussed today and uh, medical, medical anthropology. Yes. Uh, part of what, what guided the, the, the idea of the series is to try to think together, you know, medical anthropology and the history of medicine. Mm -hmm. and, and there is a sort of little thesis in, in, the, way, in the way the series is put together, namely that in doing the history of medicine in some respects is like doing an anthropology of the yeah. past. Uh, and and I, I see a lot in what you do, you know, traces of this French tradition of historical anthropology yep. of uh, historical anthropology of antiquity. But I find there the same problem that one finds, and I think it connects to, it connects to the last question that was, uh, what that was asked. Um, I see there the same problem, which is, what do we do with present categories? Mm -hmm. what, do we do with, yep. what do we do with present categories? And if one looks at what's called the, uh, the, the global mental health movement, mm -hmm. one sees that this movement is um, not undermined, but characterized by an, by an internal tension between the need to perform comparisons between cultures and therefore the need to have some categories yep that are transported from one culture to the other, and the basic principle that categories from one culture don't really apply in another. Yeah, exactly. uh, and well, I just wanted, if you can say yeah. something about this tension and whether you see it also in your work, or um, and what, mm. if yes, what mm -hmm. do you do with it? Mm. Yeah, and I think th these are, the stories of Nicanor and Democles are interesting because they work both ways. So you can say that by taking a, a concept that allegedly applies across culture, so phobia and then social phobia and social anxiety disorder, you can then use those to come back to look at the stories with a fresh pair of eyes, but then the stories undercut the categories that you first went in with, so it's a dialogue, and each is, is enhancing, enriching, but also undermining the other, and it goes on like that, I fear. Um, Certainly that's why I resist retrospective diagnosis generally. And I find it quite odd that as someone who's in her career, I've always resisted retrospective diagnosis for physical conditions, yet I'm actually finding it quite helpful to at least have a dialogue with it for a mental condition. And I don't know whether that is itself significant because with physical conditions, I've always completely resisted. You know, I'm sort of known for it, you know, never do it. And that's why I find it so funny when Michael Fontaine uh, accuses me of doing this, like, I don't normally do this. I've only done it here as a special case, and this is helping me, your questions are helping me think about why I did it then. And I think it is, it's about that weaving between the two, with the knowledge that DSM shifts as well. <laughs>
So it's not like you've got a fixed set of categories that you apply to the ancient world and you see if they help you or not, because DSM also has shifted all the way through. So in a sense, it, it, it makes you realize how contingent all those categories are. Yeah, that's been very good for me. Problems, problems ahead. Yes. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much.